House of Lords is een eerbiedwaardige instelling van het Brits parlement. We ontmoeten er een pittige politica die destijds heel wat stof deed opwaaien. Barones Shirley Williams droomde er als kind al van om parlementslid te worden en zie, nu is ze een eind in de tachtig en nog altijd politiek actief. Ze schreef een spannende autobiografie en vertelt waarom ze katholiek werd in een Anglicaans land. Baroness uh, Shirley Williams, thank you for your time because you're going to have a very busy day today at House of Lords. But uh, how shall I call you, my lady? Or, uh... Absolutely not. I mean, I'm in the House of Lords to do a job, which is essentially to advance certain causes and, pur and purposes, not to walk around with a title I can flourish because I don't believe in titles. Mm -hmm. All right for the king and for the queen and, the, and her children, but I don't really believe in titles. And I'm glad to say that almost all the hereditary lords have gone out of the House of Lords. There are only a very small number left. The hereditary principle is effectively dead in the United Kingdom. We are especially grateful because this is going to be a faith interview and politicians are not particularly keen on doing God. So why is that? Well, you gave me a very good example when, when you gave me some very helpful additional preparation before this meeting. When you said quite rightly that I'm sometimes described as devout uh, by the uh, United Kingdom press. Devout in the eyes of the United Kingdom press means only one thing, do you go to church? And if you go to church, as I do pretty regularly every Sunday, you are devout. Now, nobody in a country like Belgium, or for that matter, France or Italy, would regard that as a definition mm -hmm. of devout. It simply means I'm an active Christian. I read that uh, your father read extracts of the Summa Theologica by uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas to you when you were a child of five years old? Well, a bit more, probably about eight. Yeah. No, you're completely right. My, I mean, my father's the reason I'm a Catholic. Yes. I'm a very odd Catholic in the sense that I'm both a convert and a cradle Catholic. And my father then, as a purely intellectual exercise, he had no Italian or Irish blood, he was total Anglo-Saxon, mm -hmm. but he was persuaded by the work of of Henry, New of, Lord, of Henry Newman, yes. who of course has recently been sanctified by Pope Benedict, mm -hmm. that if you once became a Christian, the logical outcome of that was that you would be on the path to Rome. In other words, the one church that could justify being a permanent source of Christian thought and dogma mm -hmm. was the Roman Catholic Church. The other thing to say about him then was that in talking to me about Aquinas, he brought together his religion and his politics. Politics is the, should be the putting into action of some of the precepts of Christianity. In other words, everything from overseas aid to uh, education for children from disadvantaged homes to decent race relations all flow essentially from Catholic, or more precisely, more broadly, Christian principles and objectives. But those become as it were, not activated, not actually active in the real natural world, unless there is some may, way of turning him into law, or at least, at the very least, turning him into education. And that's what my father taught me. And so, if I'm a believer in the absolute equality of the races, which I am, it's because, essentially, of the Christian view, view that every human being, male, female, black, white, whatever they may be, have at their heart the divinity of God. They're all divine creations. That, however, put into practice is in the end things like race relations bills or immigration bills. And if it's, you only have the theory and not the practice, then Christianity becomes, looks very hypocritical. In your book, God and Caesar, you write that uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, um, asks a lot of people, makes uh, high claims, and that's also one reason why you wanted to be in, in that church. Yes, I think so. I felt if I was going to be a Christian, I might as well get it in the toughest form, so to speak. Yes. Um, it wasn't easy at that time. And there was, a, for example, I'm now talking about the immediate post-war period. Uh, you probably know that the Vatican thought of British labor as being something rather like communism. They never understood the difference. Well, they did later come to. Mm. In fact, the Labour Party was and remains uh, considerably more Catholic than any other of the major parties in Britain. Um, it's more usual for Catholics to vote rather to the left of centre than Anglicans in this country. I and mean, there's been a lot of work done on this. 
And that's because a great many Catholics in Britain originally came from either Ireland or Scotland. They were Celts, not Anglo-Saxons. Oh, so you said that your um, political awareness has been uh, influenced by uh, Catholicism. Your social awareness, the same thing, I suppose? Oh, well, that's exactly right. I mean, the, 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 the element of Catholicism I always found very attractive was the social teaching of the church. Mm. I went to Latin America when was it? Back in the 1970s and 80s. And I was bowled over by liberation theology. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling that I was, at, and I know that was also true to some extent of Father Ratcliffe, I felt I was looking at Christianity in practice actually working out on the ground. It was, it was quite astonishing. It mm -hmm. blew one's mind. It was so staggering. Now, the tragic about liberation theology, which I think was Christianity in practice, mm -hmm. That means involving politics mm. as well as involving theology, um, was that it tipped over in, in some cases towards Marxism, yes. and I think we now know about Marxism that whatever the uh, whatever the higher theories of Marx and Das Kapital and so on, um, Marxism threw up its own new elite, and that was a party elite, and in the way that it behaved, it was as unsympathetic as unempathetic as the as the worst kind of Catholic hierarchy, if I can dare to put it that way. Mm -hmm. And so I then realized that that, 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 that that was the danger that liberation theology could get caught up in. But the line was quite narrow because obviously the, the ideals of communism, the ideals of sharing property, the ideals of equality and so on, were not that different from the ideals exposed, expanded by yes. uh, Jesus Christ. But the difference was that the individual human being lost his or her divinity, his or her, uh, as it were, in infinite mm -hmm. um, quality of being created by God. And that meant they were not treated with the dignity that mm -hmm. they deserved and demanded. So I think even today, I'm very impressed by the, some aspects of liberation theology. And I think it's very interesting that some of the most, interest, most exciting recent political leaders have come out of Latin America. Uh, I think of Lula da Silva, Mm -hmm. in Brazil. I think of Michel Bachelet in Chile. Yes. And what strikes me about them is, first of all, they are really involved in a war against poverty, sometimes with great danger to themselves. Secondly, that they really do identify with the people on the ground, the ordinary farmers, the ordinary shopkeepers, the ordinary workers. And thirdly, that they have that out of this comes a much richer form of Catholicism that doesn't depend upon power. Which brings me to what I'm next mm -hmm. going to say. To power. And I think now what is so encouraging is that the, the, the Pope appears to be going to the very heart of the structure of the Vatican mm -hmm. and asking embarrassing, difficult and crucial questions about how the church does go back to being a church of the poor, as he calls it, mm -hmm. rather than a church of power. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the absolutely key choice is it about power or is it about love? And today we have an Archbishop of Canterbury who has insisted on staying on the banking committee of Parliament in which he asked the most incredibly acute questions of bankers who suddenly find that instead of getting away with it by <laughs> giving smooth answers, there is the Archbishop of Canterbury who was once a banker and then converted into being a leading theologian and archbishop. And in the House of Lords. And, uh, and in the House of Lords. But he, he asks questions which are so sharp really? and so candid yes. and so difficult for the bankers to escape. <laughs> and he asks them questions about yes. what is the moral compass of banking. Yes. So what he's done as a leading, th a leading uh, church figure yes. is to actually take the proper rules and principles of the churches, the Christian churches, into the world of politics and to then say, you are supposed to live by moral standards too. What are your answers to the following questions? And that's exactly right. That's yes. what I mean by saying you don't divorce the church and politics. You involve the church in politics, but in the sense of pursuing the principles that Christians are meant to live by. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wonderful. Well, you had uh, a lot of experiences as a child. You were sent to the U.S. during the war, and uh, then uh, then you came. All back. kinds of experiences. Yeah. Well, I got. To, I was. Um, I, I remember I was very, when I was very young. I had to be involved in pretty well looking after myself. For example, um, when I came back from America, 
Well, I went to America because my parents were both on the Gestapo blacklist. They were listed to because be... Because your mother was a writer, famous writer. My mother was a writer, but also a pacifist. And my father was a, an academic, but also spent a great deal of time um, trying to persuade the United States to mm. join the war against Hitler. Yeah. So they were both down, they were both on the list, and, and we know that because I got a copy of it. And yes. the, they were one of the, the, one of the very, very few non-Jewish couples who were on the list to be immediately killed if there was an invasion by Germany. And of course, at that time, everybody thought there would be, 1940, yes. when France had fallen. Mm -hmm. The assumption was that the, the, the uh, invasion would be two or three months away. Mm -hmm. And my parents, who were incredibly high-minded people, felt that they had no right to put their children at risk. They didn't intend to leave the country. They were prepared to stay here and take whatever happened. Mm -hmm. But they didn't feel they had the right to make their children into orphans. And that's where they sent us. We went to America in 1940. Um, we went to people we'd never met before in on our lives. Own. On your own. You went on your my own. Oh, my brother and me. Yeah. He was, I was nine and he was 12. So together we went. We arrived in America. We got taken off to uh, the middle of America, Minnesota lived there for three years. On the way home, I had to come on my own because my brother was old enough to join the Air Force and I wasn't old enough to join anything. So I came back on a neutral ship and to tell a long story short, the, the ship was badly damaged by a storm. We then couldn't get back to England. The flight that was meant to take us had the famous actor Leslie Howard on board and was shot down with everybody oh. killed. And we were then kept for two months in Portugal, which was a neutral country in a in um, detention um, that was only one example then you asked the question at one point when did I start realizing that the world wasn't altogether nice um, I suppose for a long time I just thought it was awfully nice I mean, I've always thought creation was a wonderful thing but I think I then became it then became home to me what had happened in the war and in 19 my the, the then Labour government uh, of uh, Britain sent a number of young people, school children really, to Germany to get to know the children of Germany and to see if they could build up a new relationship for the post-war world. And I was one of those children, I was a child, I was 17, but I drove all the way through ruined Germany to the first Social Democrat conference of the post-war Germany in 1948 in the town of Hof in, uh, in uh, the American zone of Germany. And that was the first time I saw the total ruination of Germany, the uh, you know, people living in holes, the ruined churches, the ruined housing and so on. And I suppose I then began to feel that um, you know, the, the, the very first goal had to be uh, the end of war. Although I wasn't a pacifist, I'm not a pacifist to this day, but I am a great believer in reconciliation and all the rest of it. And on that context, I just want to say uh, two things. One is that I'm a great believer that there's such a thing as a political miracle, a political miracle. And I think in my life I've seen four crucial political miracles. One of those was Gorbachev, who allowed the Soviet Union to collapse around him um, and did it consciously, and nobody got killed, nobody died. There was the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was the, which was amazing, I and mean, nobody believed it could ever fall, but fall it did, and it was ordinary people that plucked the bricks out of the Berlin Wall. There was the um, astonishing, both the release of Nelson Mandela in South Africa, mm -hmm. and the fact that South Africa moved from being an apartheid state to being an interracial state, again with the loss mm -hmm. of no lives at all. And then more recently, there were such things, I think, as the, um, uh, well, as the, as the, the move I suppose, to allow the Eastern Europeans to join the European Union. And until Ukraine, again, that happened in a totally peaceful context. Mm -hmm. And only now we're running into mm. real problems, partly because it's not quite clear where Ukraine mm. itself feels it belongs. But I mention that because people yes. are very cynical about politics and they tend to think we're all in it for what we can get out of it and all the rest of it. But there is actually this extraordinary story of miracle after miracle in politics, maybe once a generation or something like that, as there has been a miracle in the church, because I have to say that I think the election of John the Twenty Third, and the Vatican Council, and then the election of Pope Francis, mm -hmm. for me, I, the phrase I use, I hope you'll forgive me, is um, the Holy Ghost woke up and took 
took a role mm -hmm. in that appointment. Because it's very hard to see how either of those appointments actually really happen. Your mother was a pacifist. She was a deep one. Well, I should explain that she lost every single man in her life. Her fiancé, her only brother, her two best friends in the First World War. So all the men she, her family knew or were connected with were wiped out. And she then worked as a nurse throughout the last the three years of the First World War, among other places in Belgium and in France, um, deliberately to her own choice, um, in order to make her contribution to trying to build a peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, that had a huge influence on the book that she wrote, the famous book called Testament of Youth, which is essentially a, a book about how that whole generation lost its youth and lost it to the most cruel forms of warfare mm -hmm. and the reasons why she then became a writer and a, a, a missionary for peace, really. She protested uh, mass bombings in Germany. She did. It, that made her very unpopular. She protested in '43 against... Um, she hadn't protested against precision bombing. I mean, that's to say directly bombing military targets. But she did protest very strongly against the, the actual policy of bombing civilians in towns as a way of breaking their morale. And it turned out long after that she was almost certainly right because the United States Air Force did a study later of what the effect had been of what was called saturation bombing and discovered that the main effect was to mobilize women, married women for the first time in Germany mm -hmm. who'd never been mobilized before to go into munitions factories. Mm -hmm. So far from actually bringing the war more closely to an end, it almost certainly prolonged it. But she was criticized a lot for uh, that. Well, yes, she was denounced by Franklin Roosevelt, by her great friend, previous friend, Mrs. Roosevelt, um, much more in America than Britain. And one of the things that came out of that, which was interesting, was that countries that have suffered and people that have suffered tend to be much more understanding of and more opposed to the making other people suffer than those who never suffered at all. And to put it in British, British terms, a, 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 an expen a prosperous town like Bournemouth, which was never bombed, was much more likely to support saturation bombing of Germany than an industrial town like Coventry, which was not only bombed but saw its cathedral destroyed, where people understood what they were exporting, if they exported it, which was suffering to other mm -hmm. human beings. So mm -hmm. it, it, there was an interesting theological conclusion, if you like, that, that, that suffering, if understood, actually creates a much more generous and sympathetic attitude towards other human beings. As a human race, don't seem to be naturally inclined to peace. When you look at the readiness with which not only states but individuals go to war, and for instance, the book by Chris Hedges, "War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning," is a really disturbing book about our our inclinations, our evil inclinations. So, our churches, with their call to reconciliation and peace, doing something unnatural? No, I mean that's I, don't, I haven't read his book. But I, have, I feel immediately a lack of sympathy with it. Um, I think what's actually, I'm going to put it very bluntly, for centuries, the central male ethic has been a warrior ethic, all the way through the Knights, all the way through the Napoleonic Wars, all the way through the First and Second World War. And there has been an ethic of male courage, gallantry, and particularly in the context of war. In this country, King Arthur and the Round Table was the great Victorian ethical belief that the, the, the warrior spirit, but in the most generous, gallant, etc. way, was what we all most admired. My, uh, my mother was brought up on the King Arthur and the Round Table. These, king, these soldiers were all wonderful soldiers, gallant, kind, they fought like mad. Um, and that ethic has gone on and on, the cowboy in America. The, you know, the, the great Siberian explorer. Again and again, what you get, especially in the Western world, is this male myth. 
um, and it becomes a it becomes for children often translated into football field nowadays, or sports of one kind or another, mm -hmm. the Olympics and so on. It's it's quite an attractive myth, but it's largely directed to boys. Women have always been, on the whole, seen as more significantly part of the movement behind reconciliation, forgiveness, mm -hmm. peace, and I'm certainly saw that in South Africa. And I think that, therefore, the, what is now happening, slowly, which is one could call it either the masculinization of girls or more often the feminization of boys. In other words, the recognition that boys, too, have a large role within families, that they have a large role in, as fathers in bringing up children. And I think that's the way it's going. I think with any luck that we're slowly increasing the sense that men are part of the family as well as women, and that women are part of the world of work as much as men. And that begins to bring about, you probably see it most clearly in Scandinavia, a change in attitude which begins to create a more peaceful and more, uh, more reciprocal world. These things I've done Who is God to you? Good question. Um, I think insofar as I sort of, uh, as I have any concept of God, I mean certainly I see God as being one figure. I think I essentially see God in terms of the Creator, uh, Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, the touching into life of human beings. Um, and I think I also see God as being very closely involved with the huge forces of nature. I mean, I, one hates to say it, but I think we're going to be confronted with God on the issue of climate change in the most acute way. If, if I want to think of God in more personal terms, I don't see some elderly gentleman with white silvery hair and very benevolent behavior. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I, I mean, the life of Christ is the route through for human beings to some understanding of God. What has attracted you most in the life of Christ? I think the best way I can answer that is by reading you a little bit of a poem. Okay. Can I do that? Yes, yes. To me, it's an, it's a, it's an absolutely central poem in my whole attitude to religion, which, as you can see, is essentially more that of Doubting Thomas than of uh, St. Paul. But this is a poem by uh, Winston Hugh Auden, the great English poet. This poem, which is a lovely poem, is written in the memory of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German martyr, who died at Flossenburg in 1945 because of his involvement in the um, conspiracy to try to kill Hitler. And it's called Friday's Child. I'll just read it. He told us we were free to choose, but children as we were, we thought paternal love will only use force in the last resort on those too bumptious to repent. Accustomed to religious dread, it never crossed our minds. He meant exactly what he said. What reverence is rightly paid to a divinity so odd? He lets the Adam whom he made perform the acts of God. So did he really break the seal and rise again? We dare not say, but conscious unbelievers feel quite sure of judgment day. Meanwhile, a silence on the cross, as dead as we will ever be, speaks of some total gain or loss. And you and I are free to gather from the insulted face just what appearances he saves by, by suffering in a public place, a death reserved for slaves. Now, what that all means, it's a, it's a marvelous poem, I think, is essentially it's about the victory of the cross. It's about the fact that in dying and in being crucified and in being humiliated, the other aspect of God, the Son of God, but also himself a part of God, accepted humble hu humility, humiliation, suffering. And that's really the victory over power, which is the point I was making earlier. Whereas almost all the other great religious figures, the previous gods, if you like, have been figures of great power. Moloch, the Aztec god, and all the rest of them. This is not the uh, triumph of a figure of power is the triumph of a figure over power of love, 
And that's why I think Friday's Child is such a wonderful poem. You have uh, lived a life of incredible achievement. Looking back on it, what was most rewarding for you? Oh, you know, I could answer in narrow political terms. I, I think simply probably discovering the truth of a book my parents wrote together, which was said, above all nations, it's humanity. And uh, I'm a very strong internationalist, and I've been long since somebody who believes that the, that the world throws up these astonishing mm -hmm. people and astonishing marvelous creation. And we have to learn to protect that and cherish it and cherish one another. I'll finish up with something that that same poet Auden said. He said, we must, it's very short, we must live together or die. And in the nuclear world, that's absolutely a central truth. <laughs>